former Defense Secretary Mark Esper says his old boss, former President Trump, suggested shooting protesters and firing missiles into Mexico during his time in office. Chief Washington correspondent Major Garrett spoke with him about the current political climate and his time serving in the Trump administration, which he details in his new book, A Sacred Oath. Here's part of that conversation. Why did you wait two years? Well, first of all, I, I, I didn't wait two years. First, you know, I actually began writing this book a month after I left office and completed it within four months or five months. And then it had to work its way through the DOD clearance process, which took eight, nine, 10 months. And eventually I had to, frankly, sue DOD to get the book released. Uh, but going back before then, which is, uh, which is the other half of this point, look, I knew going, go, going back earlier than June 1st, right, as these issues would come up, that if I spoke up at the time, I would be fired. And my concern was if I was fired, there would be somebody else put in my place who would most likely or more likely uh, be willing to do some of these things, whether it's shooting missiles into Mexico or uh, conducting some type of, type of strike on Venezuela. My view was that I was in a better position where I was to kind of reshape things, to kind of play defense against dumb ideas than to go out, speak publicly, have my one shot, my one moment, if you will, and, and then leave the scene. And look, Major, that would have been far easier for me, for my family to kind of do that. It would have taken a lot of stress off my back. But I thought the better thing for the country was for me to stay and do what I thought was necessary. And, and look, I, I didn't just take the counsel of myself and my wife, uh, but I talked to what we call the graybeards uh, mm -hmm. in both parties. I, I mentioned Colin Powell, but my predecessors, uh, you know, Bob Gates, Leon Panetta, all of whom recommended I stay. And, and, and hang, hang in there, fight the good fight, and do what I could to you know, keep the nation on the rails in some ways, or at least the institution. And so, I, look, I struggled with this. I, I write about it in the book. It was, a, it was a dilemma for me. But at the end of the day, and even today, despite the criticism, I feel it was the right thing to do, to stay. And just I want to let you add one more thought to that, because I've had this conversation with many people who have served in your position, not exactly a defense secretary, but others who were in the cabinet or served in high positions in the Trump administration, and this ongoing struggle to do what you just described. But on the outside, all they get labeled with is you're complicit. You are aiding and abetting this thing. And I just heard you, and I want to give you one more chance to say it's not complicity, it's management. Yeah, look, absolutely. Again, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself what is most important. And for me, it was my oath of office to the Constitution. It's why the book is titled A Sacred Oath, is I felt my duty was to the country. And again, it would have been far easier for me, uh, far less nerve wracking to just kind of go out, make my speech, get fired and walk away. But I didn't think that was the best thing for the country. So I didn't see it as complicity at all. I thought, uh, you know, I still think it was doing the right thing. And look, many of us struggle with this. It's the tough thing to do. And I would say to many of those people too, look, if, if good people don't serve, or if you want the good people to leave uh, the cabinet, then who are you left with? I mean, by definition, you're only left with the bad people. And that's not good for our country. At the end of the day, you serve your country. You don't serve the president or a party or a philosophy. You serve the country. And you have to put that, uh, you have to put that at the top. And that's kind of weighed out, what I weighed out. And this is a big reason why I wrote the book for people not just to understand my perspective and how I thought through this and, and how it weighed on me, but to try and give other people, future secretaries of defense or political appointees, a, a little bit of a roadmap in case they face the same situation in the future. Your book thinks about and talks about the state of American institutions and state of American democracy. Where do you think we are? I think the biggest uh, threat facing our country is uh, extreme political partisanship, which is resulting in dysfunction in D.C., and we have to, we have to solve that problem. We've got to get people... Uh, working together, we we got to. They have to be taking less extreme positions, because the only way we move forward in this very challenging century is if our political leaders are working together for the nation's good, and and that's everything from addressing you know a, a budget that's out of control uh, to military spending uh, to to, uh, to looking at other issues that the country faces and getting aligned so we can deal with the likes of China. And I imagine that is something you see on both sides of the political aisle, this extremism. Oh, oh absolutely. Look, uh, and, and what's interesting about this point in time, and I'm somebody who worked in D.C. for 25 years, you see both parties are fighting amongst themselves, right? Progressives versus moderates within the Democrat Party, 
And, you know, you have these extreme partisans, uh, uh, the, the Trump crowd versus moderates, if you will, or traditional conservatives and the Republican Party. And so we need to we need to pay less attention to these to the wings on these parties and uh, more focus on the folks in the middle, whether it's, uh, you know, Democrat or Republican and, and find ways to work together to advance the nation's interests. And you well know, Mr. Secretary, that the former president only wants to talk about Trump Republicans, not quote unquote rhinos, which you, of course, have just most recently been labeled as by him. Uh, look, I I've been a lifelong Republican. I've worked for great Republicans when I was on Capitol Hill. Uh, I'm far more of a Republican than Donald Trump is. And uh, look, the issue the Republican Party has to figure out is this. Donald Trump, to his credit, advanced a traditional Republican agenda, lower taxes, less regulation, beefing up the military, conservative judges, all those things that Republicans love. What they need to understand, though, despite successes Trump had in those areas, we could do a lot better with a leader who is less divisive, who can grow the base, and who has kind of some core principles and integrity about him that can really help us advance, you know, a, conser a traditional Republican conservative agenda. Again, I, I call myself a Reagan Republican. That's where my heart is, my head is. That's what we need to get back to.